You've said the goal of philosophy is to thrust us into absent emergencies in order to disrupt the ongoing return to order being imposed on us. Could you tell me what that means and why it's so significant? I think we find ourselves now uh, in a condition uh, where not the only, but the greatest, in other words, the biggest emergency uh, is the absence of emergency. In other words, those emergencies that we do not take seriously into, we do not, we do not tackle, we do not confront. Uh, for example, let's say right now, let's say the, the pandemic we're living now. Uh, the pandemic is an emergency now. There's no doubt about it. But five months ago, well, seven months ago, it was an absent emergency. In other words, we were warned for the past decades by Mike Davis, by uh, so many scientists, by the World Health Organization, that a pandemic could, could arrive, could take place. Uh, and not not much has been done against that. Uh, another example, it's an, even a better example, I think, uh, is climate change. Uh, let's say air pollution. Um, that's an absent emergency. In other words, it's the greatest emergency because we are not confronting it. Uh, Seven million people die every year of um, problems related to, to the lungs due to the pollution there is, and we have not confronted that. So. Um, the greatest emergency has become the absence of emergency, those emergencies that we do not seriously take into consideration. And when we do take them, um, when we do confront them, often it's a little bit too late. Uh, and so I think it's very important to think, well, what, what's the difference between, how do we, how can I explain the difference between uh, a state of emergency, something that Kashmir and Agamben explain, and the condition in which we are now. Um, I, I think a good way to, to, to point the difference is to think of uh, the difference between George Bush presidency and Donald Trump. If we remember Donald, uh, George Bush, you know, he actually put into effect the state of emergency, the state of deception. And, uh, and again, I'm going to explain how he was using that in extra legal ways in order to, to change the laws and everything. So that would be what Bush did. But 20 years later, actually a little bit, a little bit more than that, we find ourselves with a different president for whom said what characterized him is, is the absence of emergency. Uh, Trump is known, and he's not the only one, unfortunately, for not taking emergencies into consideration. For example, uh, even, even the coronavirus, he downplayed that for a very long time. Uh, and before that, he did not recognize any uh, climate change. So he really incarnates, he really takes in, inside the, this, this whole idea of an absence of emergency. Do you think the responsibility lies collectively? Since 9-11, basically since the beginning of the century, we have experienced an intensification of the measures of control. So basically nothing really changed after 9-11, uh, nothing really changed also after the 2008-2009 financial crisis. And I'm a little bit afraid that, uh, I hope it will change, but I, things might not change too much either after this emergency we're living now. I think this, uh, this emergencies, all these emergencies have, in other words, have intensified even more uh, the role of that finance played, you know, liberal finance played, that military control played, uh, and also even from a cultural point of view, uh, there has been a stronger reduction, okay, uh, of, uh, of, of the possibilities we have of freedom. Now, example, well, let's see how we are now, unfortunately, we, many of us are are manipulated, maybe a small percent of us, but a lot of us are manipulated through uh, social media when we go to elections or when we try to find good information or when we try to... Uh, so I have a feeling that now there is an intensification, the fact that Google has so much power. Well, this is a problem as far as our freedom is concerned. Uh, this is what I try to, to explain uh, in, my, in my new book, uh, which is called Being at Large. Well, is it possible to be at large today? Uh, I think that uh, some of her, you know, in the 60s and 70s, some of her parents, they, they, they could actually go through Europe at large. Nobody will really know where you were. You might be on a train somewhere. Um, now it's very difficult to be at large. Uh, it's, uh, it's very difficult to escape in some way. Uh, although one might feel free, right? Uh, but we are free within certain uh, specific and very frame, what I like to call a global frame order. And, and there has been a reaction to that, both uh, philosophically, a, a very conservative reaction to that, and also there has been a very progressive reaction to that, which uh, I think this is, this is very clear in, um, 
is what we can see in both new realism philosophy, the so-called OOO ontology, and also all the people who have been trying to discredit any sort of postmodern views uh, that can said sustain our concern of this problem. How helpful is freedom if we are going to tackle something like climate change? The first thing we have to do is probably to recognize that there is a problem with freedom. I think that's the first point because otherwise it seems that, uh, oh, it's just the way we, we react. Well, no, there's actually a problem with freedom. Uh, there's a problem of the freedoms we have and the limits we can, we can surpass. Uh, how do we do this? Well, I think that uh, the idea of I, uh, what I try to explain in my research is that well, we have to find ways not to rescue us from emergencies, but rather to rescue us into emergencies. In other words, uh, there is a sort of connotation of salvation here that perhaps this is particularly clear in, in art. Art, I think that it, very, you see environmentalist artists, for example, that you know, they, they might show you glaciers or some environmental concern, but they're really, they're really trying to, to trust, to push us into these emergencies. I think that's one way of being free, uh, to, to, to recall, for example, that, for example, I think philosophically, I think it's important today to, to remind everyone that postmodernism is, was, not a, it's not a, was not a movement to, to, to create chaos. Um, I think Stanley Fish, which has been hosted in this festival, I think, he explained very clearly uh, in several of his papers how postmodernism did not bring chaos. Postmodernism warned us of the problem of not having any chaos at all. In other words, of having one single truth or to continue to use rationality as a sort of uh, universal paradigm through which we can impose our values upon others. So the idea of, of being in some way resistant to, to this rationality I think it's very important because, unfortunately, I think the, the, there's a whole movement called the intellectual dark web, uh, people like Peterson and Sam Harris and, and others, that, well, there is a return, a return to order there. Uh, what in, uh, they used to call in France after the First World War, the retour à l'ordre. The same the sort of idea that we have to return to order because of everything postmodernism did. The problem is that this return to order it's really this, this lack of emergency. In other words, making sure that um, well, the refugee crisis is not considered a terrible emergency as it is, or even that uh, even the climate change is not so important as it is. So the idea here is to, how do we, how do we oppose um, this return to order, this global frame return to order? Well, I think that on the one hand, we have to try to recall all what of modern philosophers from Lyotard, from Bauman, uh, so Stanley Fish and so many others, uh, recall that, well, the idea here is to, to make sure that, to make sure that philosophy, philosophy is a very good, it can be a very good servant of politics, but it's a very bad master of politics. Uh, and this is a distinction that I did not do, but Richard Royalty did. And I think the idea also of returning to authors like Richard Royalty, who, by the way, in 1997 uh, predicted the rise of Trump, if uh, it's uh, it's the uh, Democratic Party continued to behave the way it did and the way it does now. So I think there is, we still have a lot to learn uh, from there. And the fact that we return in some way to, to this modernity, uh, where that in some way justified also colonialism, I think it's an, an alarming feature. Why is it important that we be thrust into those emergencies? Why does it matter to be responding to them? Again, I think that the greatest emergencies we have are the ones we do not confront. So, um, if those are, for example, Trump represents, it's the paradigmatic example here. He represents, or also Bolsonaro, they said that the coronavirus was not an emergency for a very long time. Uh, actually, I think they're, they're even probably now uh, downplaying it as, as, as we speak. I hope not, but, uh, and I think that that's the biggest emergency we have. Those that still today, uh, you know, do not consider these greatest emergencies we have. Um, so that's the real, the first problem we have. Uh, why? Well, because um, let's, let's think of this way. What are, what are warnings? Warnings are really signs from the future. They're basically indications we have that, you know, you can, you can accept them or not. But there are signs that in some way are not there to predict the future, but they warn us. In other words, they work or they function as a sort of pressure in order that we do not, you know, in such a way that emergencies do not actually take place. 
Uh, and I have a feeling that warnings are not taken very seriously. I mean, uh, the pandemic has, they warned us for a very long time about the pandemic. And for a very long time, it has not, it has not taken seriously, was not taken seriously. Uh, and I, there's a problem here of how, how come, how come, the question is, well, how come we don't listen to warning? This is the question, I think. Well, I think one of the reasons we do not listen to warning is because of this frame order that I mentioned before. And also because, well, uh, also because, you know, given social media uh, tremendous power and, and in the internet in general, uh, and therefore the, the lack of uh, authority now established newspapers, established experts, established universities, in, in other words, those traditional vectors of authority we always uh, founded our beliefs on, which of course were not ultimate truth, but they had some sort of authority. You know, I think the New York Times has more authority than an anonymous blogger somewhere on the web. So um, the problem here is that they lost that authority. And, in, and today, it is, it is, you have to actually make an effort in order to, to, to find the truth. Also because, and this is something, something else which I think it's very important is, well, you know, uh, Bruno Latour, his uh, last, last book translated into English, uh, Down to Earth, he explains that facts, truth, uh, do not, they don't work on their own. Uh, a scientist can come and explain to us right now the process through which ice is melting, but that's not enough uh, for us to make, to do something about it. In order to, for as a collective society to understand it, we need many other factors of authority. For example, public debates or, uh, or other scientists who also explain it, other politicians who also agree upon it. So facts alone don't work. Uh, this is why I think that what you, what you said before, why do we need to be pushed into this emergency as well? Because unfortunately, truth alone does not work. Uh, this is why I think it's a good example here is um, how come Greta Thunberg, which I admire like everybody I think does, how come her message works better than so many scientists? Well, her message works better than so many scientists because her message has more, it's more intense than the message that perhaps a scientist managed to get through. Well, there is an intensity there of truth, okay, that we need in order to, uh, in order to react to this absence of emergencies. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI-TV.